Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic Wednesday, most fun day of the week, because you either can look backwards and dwell on the past, or you can look forward and, well, be concerned about the future, or you can live in the present and work hard. Today, we have a very important topic. And that topic is essentially that you need to make sure you work a lot, but that you're also patient. This is especially true in anything where you put something in, you wait a while, and then with any luck, you get a reward. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds a whole lot like poker, right? Whenever you play poker, whenever you first start, your goal is very often to learn and to get good. Right? Your goal is not to win as much money as fast as you can. If that is your goal, it's probably not going to work out so well. And you may say, well, why can't I just get rich quick? And that's because poker's not a get-rich-quick game. It looks like a get-rich-quick game. People see, you know, look, look at Jonathan Little. He's 21, and he's won a World Poker Tour title. There's a trophy right back there. When I was 22, I was 22, not 21, and I won a title. And people see that and think... Anybody can do it very quickly, but what they don't realize is that I was grinding hard for years, for five, four years, huh, funny enough, I had grinded hard for four years before I had even a chance to be successful, and um, it's important to realize that. So how do you work a lot but do so patiently, not demanding and expecting results, right? Well, first things first, don't waste your time. Your time is very valuable. Make sure that you consume things that are beneficial to your life. If they are not beneficial to your life, well, you probably shouldn't be doing them. You should be doing other things. Um, I mean, I know I have this issue where every once in a while I'll sit and I'll play Hearthstone for an hour. And then I realize, what did I do? I just wasted an hour of my life. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have hobbies. Um, hobbies are very valuable. But at the same time, you want to make sure that the things you do that are unproductive do not take over your life. Um, for example, Survivor starting tonight. Survivor is one of my favorite shows on TV. And um, today's the, the first episode of the next season. I've watched lots of them. And um, it's a complete waste of time. Actually, it's not a complete waste of time because you get to think about strategy. Um, that's how I view it. I view it as a strategy game. And that's interesting and neat. Oh, hi, James. You want to talk about delayed gratification and growing things? A while back, I planted a seed, and look what popped up. <laughs> Boop! It's Mr. James. Funny how that works, right? What? Yeah, you see a book. Yeah, that's your book. I have to fix it. You broke it. Can you say hello to everyone? Who's that? Oh, Daddy. Yeah, that's Daddy. Who else do you see? Two. Did you have a good weekend? Okay. And today's Wednesday. Can you say happy Wednesday? Yeah, happy Wednesday. Can you say it loud? Hey, boss. Yeah, that's your book. I'll fix it, and then I'll give it back to you. James broke a book. I have to fix it. Give me a kiss. Give me a bye-bye kiss. More day, more daddy. Yeah, there's James and Daddy on the screen. More daddy. Can you blow, blow James a kiss? Do baby shark. You want to do baby shark? Okay. Baby shark. Do, 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 no, do, do, do. Yes. Oh, you want to do it on the computer? Well, we can't do that right now. I'm in the middle of a show. All right, have fun. I love you. Can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> See you. Bye, Daddy. Have fun. Yeah, we shot it. You plant seeds and good things come. Where's his guitar? It's elsewhere. So, I always get sidetracked when James comes around. That's okay, though. So, how do you develop this mindset? Well, it's very important to look at farmers, right? What do farmers do? They get their seeds... And then they plant them, right? They plant their seeds. And then, what do they do? Do they go, do they sit back, and do they have coffee, and do they wait? No, they don't sit back and have their coffee and their wait. They go to their other field over here, and then they spread the seeds over here. Then they go to their other field over here, and they spread their seeds over here. They spread their seeds all over. They work very hard. And then, inevitably, what happens? Well, vegetables come, and then they feast. They get to eat the kale that they planted a long time ago. It takes a long time for kale to come.
And then, what else happens? Oh, over here, look, from the field they planted over here. We have parsley, you know? Got to finish eating your kale first. But then the parsley comes. And then they eat the parsley. As much of it as they want. You don't really need too much parsley. But that is what a farmer does, right? And that's what you need to do. You need to take that mindset. If you take this mindset, you're going to be able to embrace the idea of delayed gratification, right? And the thing is, I think a lot of people think that the farmers just plant their seeds one time initially. Then they forget about it. And then they come back like, multiple years later, and they, then they reap the rewards. And that is true, you can do that, but that's the slow way to do it. You want to plant the seeds all over. You want to constantly be planting while you're eating your kale. You should still be planting seeds, right? Plant the seeds, plant them all over, plant them all the time. And that's gonna be very, very beneficial. So, how do you do that? Well, I think you have to understand that if you work harder and work more than other people, assuming you do it intelligently, you're gonna progress way faster. This is especially true in things that are exponential. If you look at the growth of a poker bankroll, it's exponential, right? Say you're bankrolled for $1, $2. If you play enough with a positive win rate, you will be bankrolled for two, five, and then you get to move up, and then you get to play two, five, right? Um, from there, if you play enough, you get bankroll for 510, and then you move up to 510. And as you move up each step along the way, you make more and more money per hour, right? So if you work 20 hours a week, let's say, and I work 80 hours a week, what's going to happen is you're going to have a puny little bankroll like this, and we're going to have a gigantic bankroll like this. And now we're going to make way more money because we have been working hard and grinding. No one wants to eat this. And, uh, and look, it's so easy to get rid of, too. You want to have a big bankroll. But not only do you want to have a good bankroll, a big bankroll, you want to have lots and lots of skills, right? Your goal should be to get good to the point that any situation that presents itself is good for you, right? And this comes up a lot at... Um, live cash games. If you're sitting there and you normally play 5, 10, or 10, 20, but random business people want to walk in and gamble really big, if you're not properly bankrolled, if you don't have the big bankroll, you don't get to play without gambling, right? And you don't want to gamble. Pro professional poker players really don't want to gamble. So what you have to do is you have to be well prepared. How do you get well prepared? You work harder and faster and smarter than everyone else. So you work very quickly and hard and in the, in the short term, and you do it every single day. Every day, you work hard. Work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard. And inevitably, you start having a bigger bankroll, and a bigger bankroll. We're out of kale, we ate it all already. You have some more parsley added in, more parsley added in. And then, you know, once you have a gigantic bankroll like this, you can start living off of it. Look, if we did, we take a big bite out of it, it doesn't even matter, right? It's like I didn't take anything out of it. That was a car payment that came up and you didn't know about it. Or that was, um, you broke your leg and you have to pay to get it fixed. Like, it doesn't even matter. But if your bankroll is like this, and, um, you know, something happens, say your house gets flooded, you're not left with anything, right? And that's not what you want. So, you have to make sure that you understand what the goal is. And the goal is a long-term goal. Manex says, as you were building your bankroll, how did you pay for yourself as well? Well, the answer is don't take money out of your bankroll until you're winning so much to the point that you don't need to. Watch it down with bone marrow. We don't have the bone marrow right now. We do have mushroom tea, though. Today we have mushroom tea. So we have our mushroom tea. Um... But, I mean, whenever I was a young kid playing, I was 18 years old, I had no expenses. Actually, the expenses I had, I was working a dark job for $10 an hour, and I was playing poker in my spare time. A lot of people think I need to quit my job and quit my everything I'm doing and then play poker. But no, do it in your spare time. Get good to where 
you lose my train of thought. I'm reading a quote. Um, you need to make a, make a point to not take money out of your bankroll. You can get good in your spare time. Don't think you have to drop everything you're doing in life to, to get good at poker. I mean, I, I did it. I mean, everyone gets into poker just playing a little bit, right? Get Start playing a little bit, get decent, and then go from there. Do you take vitamin packs? No. Maybe I should. Don't judge the day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. That is absolutely true. It's important to have lots and lots and lots of seeds ready to plant. Here, look, we have tons and tons of seeds ready to plant, right? We can plant as many seeds as we want. <sighs> Did I play illegally underage? No. Fortunately, I didn't find poker until I turned 18. Do you have any offers for Inner Circle? I'm not sure. Send us an email. In your spare time, just build the role and play full-time eventually. That's right. Like I said, whenever I was a young person, I didn't take money out. I didn't cash out until I had like $200,000 in my account, which may sound silly, but um, I wasn't playing to make money. I was playing because I love to play poker and like seeing my score go up, my score of my money. In 2019, going pro is laughable. The game has peaked. 99% of people will fail. I completely disagree. Well, most people will fail, but not the um, dedicated people, the people who work hard. If you look out there, tons and tons and tons of people are succeeding. How are they succeeding? They are succeeding because they are devoting their lives to it. They are using this practice of delayed gratification. They're not trying to get rich quick. They realize their goal is to get good. And if you get good, you will grind it up. How do you do life insurance? I don't have any life insurance at the moment. Probably should. How do we do health insurance? My wife has health insurance because she is a lawyer. Should you wait until you're properly rolled to play or try to build exponentially? Depends on how you want to approach the game. I take it slow. Then you have to pay taxes. Back then, uh, poker taxes online were not so clean and clear. Um, essentially, people paid when they cashed out. It's probably different now. Um, let's see. How much should you be playing slash studying? It depends on your goals, right? What are you trying to accomplish? If you, if you only have an hour and a half to play each day, then play or study, then you need to be playing some and studying some. If you're trying to go pro, clearly you're devoting a ton of time to it. All right, let's see. So in my life, especially at this point, and really I kind of always have done this, I've always taken the long-term view. I have been more than happy to sacrifice now in exchange for the ability to do better later, to have the opportunity to do better later. Um, whenever I write a book, quite often you have the option to get a big advance up front and a small royalty or a very small advance up front and a much bigger royalty. I don't want the small advance, right? If you take a small advance, here it is, right? We have a little tiny advance. You eat it, then it's gone. But fortunately, I've been lucky to where, boop, long-term royalties come in, boop, because the, the um, books are good, right? I know I'm going to put out good work. I'm not trying to put out shoddy work. And if you put out good work and people appreciate your work and they tell you this by buying your products, then that's great, right? And you're going to reap long-term rewards. So would you rather have this now or this later? You'd much rather have more later. At least I would. So. The times you can't do that or when you have put yourself in a situation where you have to make money. That's the problem with a lot of people, is that they paint themselves into a corner. They do things in life, like um, figuring out ways to have gigantic expenses, by figuring out ways to always have drains on their bankroll, by having bad habits that are drains to their bankroll, by not spending their time wisely. They do all sorts of things that hurt their chances of success to the point that they have to take the little little bit of money that's thrown up front because they have no other option, right? They have to pay the bills. And whenever you have to pay the bills, I would tell you, you need to work way harder than you're working. 
most people who have painted themselves into the corner, if they can't get out by working 100 hours a week, should probably file for bankruptcy and start over. No, it feels dirty to do, but if you can't get out of your hole by working literally 100 hours a week, doing everything you can, you gotta start over, start planting new seeds. You're thinking moving to New York City. That may not be wise, it's very expensive here. If you have no bankroll, get out and work and get it. What did I do? I worked at an airport and at a comic book store to get my bankroll. Everyone has to work somewhere to get their bankroll. If you think you're just going to have a bankroll gifted to you, then that's not how life works. You have to get out there and work. A lot of people think, I have no bankroll, what am I supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to take it slow. I started with $50, right? Start with $50 and grind it up. Let's see. Eric says, thanks for helping you so much. Good, I'm, I'm always happy to help. You lose your patience after playing for 12 hours a day for three days straight. Yeah, well, you're playing too much. <laughs> Do you have any tips to keep your patience? Get up, take breaks, go take walks. Understand that tournaments are a long grind, right? I mean, understand that's what you're doing. How do you eat raw kale? Oh, it's easy. You take the kale and you put it in your mouth and you chew it. Having a career and playing as a serious recreational player is the best thing you've done for your poker game. Yeah, good idea. Are you moving out of New York City? Yeah, good idea. Um, you're trying to find a poker place to play? That's going to be, most likely, Florida in the South. I hear um, Miami's pretty decent. Fort Lauderdale's pretty decent. Um, California, Los Angeles is great. And uh, Vegas, those are some very, very good, clear options. Now, there may be uh, less clear options. Like, you may want to go to D.C. and play in the new casinos they have in that area. I know Boston maybe just opened up the casino. They're doing that soon. That might be a good option. Um, I don't know. It depends on what your goals are, right? If you want to be able to play as big as you possibly want to, then you're going to need to move to one of the major places. But if you want to play like 2-5 or 5-10, then maybe you want to go to a smaller place that's way softer. We have an example of a poker hand. You raise 8-7 suited. Everybody's typing in stuff. Let's see. All right. You raise 8-7 of hearts from the button. Call by the big one. Flop comes terrible. You're betting two-thirds pot on a terrible board. I mean, maybe, maybe not. Pick up the draw on the turn. Say so bet again. Sure. River's the eight of spades. Is this a bet again or not? Uh, yeah, definitely. All the draws came in, right? When lots of draws come in, you should be bluffing, even though you made a pair. Bankroll management is the toughest thing. Go to jonathanlillpoker.com slash bankroll and read about it. The Boston should, uh, casino should open up in June or July. It should be very nice. Yeah, good. Best way to increase your bankroll is to just work more hours and outwork them. Yeah, that's right. Accurate. Outwork your opponents. That is the only reason the main reason I have succeeded. I have been, I am happy to work hard for things. So let's talk about not just poker. Let's talk about investing, right? Say you, um, they're going to be doing some angel investing. We're going to sprinkle a little bit of money into a bunch of companies. Don't sprinkle a lot of money into one company. That's not good bankroll management. Say we're going to sprinkle a little bit of money into a lot of companies, understanding that we're not going to get any money back for seven to 10 years. I've been doing this recently and it's a lot of fun. You learn a lot, but also you know that you're accepting a high amount of variance and also you have to have very good bankroll management, sort of like a, a, a discipline that requires, well, discipline. <laughs> and understanding that, you will very likely achieve higher than normal returns in exchange for having your money locked up and in exchange for, you know, sometimes you lose it all. It's a tough thing, right? It's kind of like playing poker tournaments. Um, I like it though, because often the people who are willing to take more risk will get greater rewards. And once you are properly bankrolled, you can do that type of thing. Um, also there's, well, huh, Johnny, Johnny says no limit. There's almost no limit to the amount you can invest, which is very nice. Um, seems like you can't get yourself out of the hole since the beginning of this year. Playing 80% good and 20% bad will stop playing poorly. If you play poorly, you're gonna lose. Poker is about making money at the end. Correct, at the end. When is the end? A lot of people want to make money now, right? You don't make money now, you make money at the end. Um, let's see. What's the softest casino? I don't know. 
Obviously, 1-2 is going to be softer than 2-5, but 2-5 you get to play two and a half times as big. Um, so if you want to be investing in long-term things, understand that you're, again, a farmer, right? A lot of people, they want to invest a little bit of money. Here we go again. They want to invest a little bit of money in, let's say, a Vanguard fund, which is a great thing to do. But then, you know, something happens, and they need to cash it out because they didn't use proper bankroll management. They had $10,000 to their name. They put $9,000 in, the in the Vanguard or something like that and thought, all right, I'm going to put that in there and leave it forever. But then something happens and left with nothing. Instead, you can put in longer-term things where the money's locked up. Sometimes it'll give you a guaranteed return. Guaranteed return. Nothing's ever guaranteed, but it'll give you a consistent return, right? But you can't get it out. That almost forces you to manage your bankroll properly. Otherwise, you're just doing a really dumb play, right? So with $10,000, we never put 9000 in something they can't get for five or 10 years. And you'd be smart, right? If you put $500 in there, maybe that's the right play. Or $1,000 in there, maybe that's the right play. And then a little while down the road, seven years later, you will have doubled your money. Are you happy to sit there and wait for seven years? Most people are not. So most people want the, the gratification now. They want to put their money in their Vanguard fund you want to put 9,000 in and get 9,100 back tomorrow or in a month, right? That's not what you need to do. You need to be able, you need to, be able to take the long-term approach. You might be dead in seven years. That is a problem. You have to have a trust set up. Whenever you make investments, they need to be set up and the um, Jonathan Little revocable trust as amended, right? These are just things you need to do. You need to have a trust set up in case you do die. That way, whenever you do die, your family and friends don't get taxed infinitely on that. Play satellites. I completely disagree. They're fantastic for people who have small bankrolls. I completely disagree, Eric. The reason I disagree is because when you play a satellite, you're, let's say, 1 in 10 to cash. Then you have to go play another tournament. They are 1 in 10 to cash. It means you're going to cash out. You're going to get any money back 1 in 100. You know how much variance there's going to be if you only cash one in a hundred times? A lot of variance. Infinite variance. Just because a game exists does not mean you have to play. Demonte says, this is how people got crushed with cryptos. Yeah, apparently some people out there were saying you should be investing all of your money in cryptocurrencies. And, um, well, you shouldn't invest all your money in anything. That should be pretty obvious. And if you do, well, yeah, you might get rich and you might get broke. Ideally, you don't want to get broke. I think a lot of people won't mind going broke. Eric says 20% of people cash in the satellites. Okay, sure. 20% of people cash in the satellite, one in 10. Let's say one in eight cash in the tournament. So one in five times one in eight is 40. One in 40 times you get any money back. And that's only a min cash, right? Depending on how many people are in the field. Let's say you're only playing a hundred person tournament, a small one. You're gonna win it. Let's, so let's say you're gonna take top four, top three spots. Well, break even, right? Um, three out of 100 times, so 3% three three times 20% uh, is what? Can't even do that math. 0.6% of the time, you get a good score. It means you have to play, um, what, call it 200 satellites before you get a big score? That's a lot. That's a lot, that's a lot. Diversify, it's a great idea, it certainly is. I've been playing 19 years and never gone broke. That is the goal. You definitely don't want to go broke. What do I suggest for a poker player with anger issues? Check out Elliot Rowe. He will help you a lot. Someone asked if I ever had tilt issues. Yes, and Elliot Rowe helped me. Elliot Rowe, very, very good mindset expert. What else do I have here? Um, yeah, I mean, really, the goal is to figure out how to use your skills to plant seeds long term. Some of them, most of them, are not going to survive and they're going to die. A lot of people don't like that idea. I've worked with a lot of companies in the poker space and outside the poker space, and almost all of them have died. That's just the nature of businesses, right? Almost all of them die. I try lots and lots and lots of things. Most of them die, but some of them thrive, right? Pokercoaching.com is thriving, and it's fantastic. Oh, look, another seed. We planted another seed. Look what happened. Is this baby on drugs? <laughs> Look at this baby. Is he on drugs? What do you all think? 
This is Thomas. Here, you want some parsley? John. You want some parsley? No, no parsley for Thomas. He's too little. Can you say hello? I think he's tired. Is that your mommy? Mommy's over there. When are you going to come into another stream? Sure. I'm going to watch the baby for a while while he's behaving. Um, yeah, here's Sir Thomas. Friend, have you got 900%, 9,000% return on some stock? Yeah, sure. I mean, listen, you have to understand, though, Kevin. Sometimes things are going to blow up and you're going to get lucky, and usually they're going to go to crap, right? Just like I said, most of the things I do go to crap, and some of them blow up. Like I said, PokerCoaching.com is blowing up, and that is good and fine, but understand, I had to do many, many things before we found something that stuck well, right? While we're, while we're here, and I can't concentrate because I have a baby in front of me, we're doing a webinar tonight, by the way. Oh, what do you see? You see little Thomas over there? Yeah. We're, we're doing a webinar tonight on how to play from the small blind against a loose aggressive razor from late position. It's going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, you can find the link to sign up at Jonathan Little, or Twitch, what, what site? Uh, Twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. Also, on Instagram, we have a, a bit image there you can click and sign up. So, 9 p.m. tonight, I'm doing a free webinar for all of you. We're going to be talking about the ranges you can play and how to adjust based on who's in the big blind, based on who the razor is, based on how deep you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's it. Eric says 0.006%. Yeah, not a whole lot, Eric, right? One in, one in 6,000, is that what it is? I don't know. Anyway, it's not very good. You want to get a big score one in 6,000 times, one in 600 times, whatever, pick a number, it doesn't really matter. It's a lot. One in 600 is a lot. Okay, you want this? You want this? Try it. Just try it. Oh, you don't have any teeth. He's very focused. He's in the zone. Oh, hi. You want this baby back? I'm going to keep him. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll get rid of the baby. I can't put a sentence together when the baby's in my hands. Do you know that? Why are you on mute? All right, say bye-bye to everyone. Bye, Thomas says. Say bye-bye. Yeah. We love you. You're a good boy. You're a good boy. Thomas has a good poker face. Yes, he does. Okay, bye. <laughs> A sentence together. <laughs> James outside said, oh hello Thomas. <laughs> James is a silly boy. Trying to not spill my uh, water. We have all sorts of um, vegetables laying around this morning. Um, so what else? What else do we have to talk about this? Be patient, right? Work hard today. Work hard, hard, hard today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, every single day with your eye on the long-term prize, understanding that people who want to get paid now, people who want to have results now, get sometimes results, but often they're very, very tiny. And the thing is, is that people see people who get rich quick. Someone just said, my friend invested not in some cannabis stock and had a 900% return. I'm like, yeah, sure, it happens sometimes. And he was probably gambling hard if it was actually a significant amount to the point he was bragging about it. Whenever you're diversified, some things will shoot up and other things will go to zero, right? And it is what it is, right? If you're well diversified, it's not going to be a big deal. Like whenever you invest in angel investing, right? Eight out of 10, nine out of 10, seven out of 10 are going to go to zero. You know that going in ahead of time. And these are people who are trying their best and devoting their lives to their product or their company, or whatever it is. And that's okay. Like whenever you go to play a poker tournament, you know 80-ish percent of the time you're gonna get no money back. You just know it, right? It's just like, you're gonna be there trying your best. It's not like you're not trying, and you're gonna go to zero. And that's okay, right? So once you understand that, you will be properly diversified, and also you're going to plant lots of seeds. I don't think it's that smart to work hard on only one project, especially if that one project is very 
if it is it's like really vital if it succeeds or fails. I mean, this is why I have all sorts of things going on because if one revenue stream goes away, let's say we have all these revenue streams, right? Here we have all these revenue streams, okay? Some of them are little, some of them are bigger. Let's say the biggest one goes away. Right now, pokercoaching.com, my biggest revenue stream. Let's say it goes away. It's a whole pile, gone. We didn't even get to eat it, pretending like I didn't eat it. Well, we still have a nice little bushel left, right? It's not the end of the world. Say um, Amazon stops paying me all my books. And then, well, we still have a little handful left, right? Compare this to what a lot of people do. They have one big thing that they care about. And then uh, that goes away. They have nothing left, right? And that's why you need to make sure you are diversified. And you get diversified by working hard every single day and making the point to better your life. Because at the end of the day, no one's going to better your life for you. You have to better it for yourself. See, that's why you don't like being diverse and investing. It seems like you lose big profits by being in too many places. You do give up the potential for big swings, definitely. But just like a poker bankroll, you don't want big swings. You want slow, consistent growth. You do not want big swings, Dean Nelson. Sure, you can have big swings if you'd like, but then you're just gambling. And when you gamble, sometimes you go broke. I mean, for example, imagine, well, look at cryptocurrencies. Great example, right? Depending on when you got in, some people got rich, some people got broke. You don't want to go broke, right? I mean, at least I don't want to go broke. Maybe maybe other people don't care so much. But imagine you put all of your net worth in cryptocurrency six months ago. You'd have like zero dollars now. Not zero dollars. You'd have, you know, 20 cents on the dollar. Imagine you put it in 20 years ago. Well, you couldn't do 20 years ago. Imagine you put it in five years ago. You'd be rich. Now, you may say, yeah, just keep it in there long enough and it'll eventually go up. We don't know that. I mean, look at... Uh, gold and silver, right? There's a time where silver was $50 an ounce. I don't know what it is now. It's probably like $15 an ounce. If you put your money in silver when it was $50 an ounce, I know I did. Huh. Uh, well, you lost two-thirds of your equity, right? And this is when a lot of people thought it was a decent bet. And turns out it wasn't. One thing you'll learn if you've been around long enough is that whenever everyone is saying something's a good bet, mm-mm, mm-mm. Fortunately, we dodged the cryptocurrencies a little bit because everyone was saying it's a good bat. It's actually interesting because everyone in the poker world has always said it's a good bat. No one's like, oh no, it's a terrible thing. Um, except for whenever it got really high. All the smart people, the, um, well, <laughs> the people who are not kids, all the, all the um, older, wiser people in the poker world, these are often, often like world-class hedge fund managers and whatnot. They said, oh no, don't put your money in that. And if you're in it, sell, sell, sell. And... Um, a lot of people didn't listen. They got crushed. When everything is high and hyped up, that is the exact time you want to be out of it. And when everything is being completely crapped on, when it looks like it can't go any lower, well, it can still probably go a little bit lower. But um, that's when you want to be buying, when everyone hates it. The problem is that whenever you buy it, when everyone hates it, it could sit there at the bottom for a very long time. It takes quite a while for things to get hyped up again. And when it gets hyped up, that's when you sell it. Whenever it's in the dumpster, that's when you buy it. No one likes buying trash, though. But trash quite often turns to treasure. And, you know, the thing is that it's really easy to say these things in a vacuum, just like sitting here, right? But whenever it comes to it, will you actually make the call and do it? This happens in stocks a lot. Um, if you look at, let's just say, Tesla stock, for example, it swings all over the place. When it's swinging all over the place, they're like in trouble with the government. They're going to get shut down, right? And then when it turns out, oh, you know what? They're not going to get shut down. Then it spikes. So you have to be buying this when it looks like there's a chance the company will literally go to zero. Um, a lot of people a lot of people are scared to buy when it looks like things are going to completely, completely go to zero. Look at Facebook stock right now, right? Um, well, Facebook, the company, right? They are in trouble with all the governments. Their, their members hate them. <laughs> it looks terrible. Whatever it looks even worse, like let's say they send Zuckerberg to jail or something, that's probably when you want to buy it. And that's when everyone's going to be hating on it hard. It's scary to buy whenever uh, they send the CEO to jail and all the, all the members leave. That said, I mean, that's when it can also go to zero. That's the tough part. But you have to understand that if you buy it and it goes to zero, yes, you lose all your money, but the up potential upside is way higher. It's like you're playing a slot machine, right? Say you go play the uh, Sex and the City slot machine. 
the one with the progressive jackpots. Whenever you play, and let's say Charlotte, the jackpot Charlotte is five times what it started at, starts at let's say $10, gets up to 50, then it's a pretty good time to play. Sure, you may not be the one to hit it. Sure, it may not get hit while you're sitting there. It may not get hit for a long time, but when it gets hit, you're gonna get paid $50 instead of $10, right? So it gets hit the same amount of the time, but when it hits, you get paid 50 instead of 10, making it worth playing if you care about winning a little bit of money. Why do you spend some time playing small poker, coaching tournaments with your members? Because I don't have a lot of time, Plaza. I have to learn about stock of stock. Uh, I have to learn about the stock market and slot machines. <laughs> Mutual funds. John, get out of mutual funds. One big piece of advice for everyone here. Please listen to this. If your retirement money is in mutual funds, you are getting hosed almost certainly. You mentioned REITs, real estate investment trusts, right? This is where they take your money and invest it in houses, which is perfectly fine. Um, you can get REITs, though, very, very cheaply with almost no overhead, no fund management fees and whatnot. If you look at companies like Vanguard, right? Vanguard's a great one. Wealthfront, that's another great one, where they take almost no management fee, and that essentially results in you getting to keep all the profits. If you are in mutual funds, they're often taking one or 2% per year. Let's say they're taking 2% per year, but you're only making 6% per year. They're making, how much? Do some math. They're, make, they're taking one third of your money. That is brutal. Right? That is terrible. They're taking a third of your money, every a third of your profits every year. And if that happens over and over, you're going to get crushed. You want them to be taking like none of your profits or 0.025% of your profits or something like that. And there are a lot of low cost funds out there. Uh, Vanguard started it off and still one of the best ones. <sighs> Tony Robbins, book about money is one of the best books. Yeah. Tony Robbins has a book about money. He talks about a lot of these things. Um, it's good that, that he's getting that in the hands of lots and lots of people, but this has been common knowledge for a long time that you do not want to be in mutual funds because they take a huge percentage. And it's been proven through time, through lots and lots of data, that they do not outperform the market. So you're essentially paying someone to make decisions that are worse than break even. It'd be like backing someone in a poker tournament at 1.2 when you're buying them, 1.2 markup, but they're actually only an 80% ROI player. That's not a good idea, right? Sure, you'll get some money back, but way less than if you just bought someone at break even, or if you played yourself and broke even. If you played yourself and lost 80, lost 20%, you'd do better because you're not paying 1.2, right? So anyway, be very careful. Um, someone's recommending various REITs. Listen. You want to make sure whatever you're investing in, like the, the track record is relevant, but it's not actually that important. Like if you look at mutual funds, there are some that crush the stock market. Some, some do. If you look at those 10 years later though, very often they're not. Why is that? It's because very often they're running hot. If you take 100 mutual funds each year, five or 10 of them are gonna just crush the market. They will. But the other ones are all gonna lose or break even or something like that, or win tiny. And that's not what we're going for. We don't want to be paying VIG for the experience. One thing everyone here needs to understand is that unless you are a professional investor with, I don't know, $100 million net worth or more, you do not know what you're talking about. You think you do. You have just enough information to get yourself in trouble. It's very important to realize that if you do not have literally $100 million net worth, or more, and I'm probably guessing none of us here do. Maybe not 100 million. Let's say let's say five million. Let's because you know certainly there are some younger people who just got started. If you don't have five million dollars net worth, and you, that you got from investing, you would do way better just putting your money in a fund that has a very low fee, like Vanguard funds, for example, where they just buy everything. They buy everything, and they know that everything on average goes up over time. Everyone who thinks that they can trade, they um, very often can't. People think they know more than they know. They really do. I mean, look at poker, right? I mean, poker is a beautiful example of this. Everyone thinks they're pretty good, yet almost no one wins. Why is this? And don't say the rake. 
Um, the rank does matter, but what matters is they're just not nearly as good as the best people, right? Whenever you move up higher and higher, you will inevitably run into people who are better than you. And the tough thing about stock market investing or investing in anything is there are some very, very big fish out there who gobble up all, well, very big sharks out there who gobble up all the little fish. People may not realize this, but all the money won and lost at the super high stakes in poker, a lot of that comes from the tiniest games. It trickles up. The winners at $0.05, five cent, $0.10 cent, no limit move up to $0.10, 10 cent, $0.25 cent, no limit and lose. The winners there move up and they lose. The winners there move up and they lose. To the point that all of that money from the bottom is taken to the top and gobbled up by the best players in the world. Right? That is how the poker economy works. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's a rough thing, right? And you have to understand that unless you are actually at the top, and I promise you none of you are at the top in investing, then you need to do the things that are definitively proven to win. And the only thing, main thing that's been definitively proven to win is buying everything and sitting on it for forever. Don't think you're better than other people. Would you say my low stakes game is good for 2-5? Yeah, absolutely. Don't play slots. Some slots are plus EV. You just need to know what to look for. It's kind of like poker, right? Most, uh, I mean, some, some games are amazing. Some games are not. And slots, way fewer games are amazing than um, are terrible. Talk to Ali Kessler. He's the uh, resident slot expert. I've learned, a ton about, a lot of, I've learned a ton about slots from him. Plaza has a fun story. He lost 174,000 pounds trying to invest it. Despite you doing due diligence for weeks. Well, Plaza, you're not a professional investor, right? You say it's a glorified roulette wheel. If you put 174000 in something like, well, any, any major index or just Vanguard funds, any of them, pick one, you're not going to go to zero. It's impossible because you're invested in everything. Everything can't go, can't go down. I don't know anything about what Plaza did, but what, what happens to a lot of people is they um, work at a company. Let's say they work at the local power company. The local power company gives you all of your stock benefits in the form of the company's stock. So let's take Enron, for example, right? You work at Enron. Every month, they give you $1,000 into your retirement account. It seems great in the form of Enron stock. But what happens after 20 years is you have, I don't know, 500 k in Enron stock. But what happens if Enron goes broke? Well, you lose all of your money. You lose all of your retirement. The smart people who worked at Enron diversified. And, you know, they realize I don't need all of the money in my company, but a lot of people are emotionally blinded. They think this is my company. I work here. I think everything's great because I work here. I know everything. But you don't. You just don't. You have to be realistic and honest with yourself. <sighs> if you're picking your own stocks, it's important to stick to companies in the industry you're an expert in. I, can, I agree with that, but I also disagree with that. For example... If you had to ask me which company is a better stock to buy, Party Poker or Poker Stars, I don't know. I would think the obvious answer is probably Party Poker because they are in favor of the pros right now. But that's my perception as a pro. For all, all I know, one of the companies is stone broke and the other one has all the money. I don't know, right? Because I know a lot about poker. I promise you, I know more about poker than like almost all poker players. And I know a lot about business, probably more about business than most poker players. Not all, I'm certainly not a pro at business. Yet, I would definitely not feel qualified to say which of those two companies is better to invest in long term. Because I just don't know. And I know I don't know. Imagine you know everything about toothpaste. And you know one toothpaste company is way better than the other. It's more healthy. It cleans your teeth better, etc., etc. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to win. Marketing is a real thing. Public perception is a real thing. Um, you know, like habits are a real thing. What's going to be covered in modern poker theory? Lots and lots of game theory examples and how to adjust based on your opponents. Does it cover a lot of topics? It does. It's going to be a good book. Table of contents should be out at some point. If you have a question about my charts, feel free to ask. Your dad worked for a natural gas company that got bought by Enron just before it crashed. He lost everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, this happens. Why does this happen? Because people don't diversify. They are blinded by the idea that my company is the best. 
And listen, your company's not the best. I'm sorry. And it's just true. I mean, maybe it's the best. It probably isn't. And the thing is, is that you just don't know what's going on. If you're an employee of a company, you do not know what's going on at the top in their ivory tower, right? For all you know, they're embezzling all the money and, and the company has no funds left. Look at Full Tilt, right? No one thought there was a problem at Full Tilt over from the outside. I mean, tons of people kept tons of money in there because they thought it was completely safe. And um, look what happened, right? Turns out the company had no money. And that's despite them making millions and millions and millions of dollars each month. So, I mean, a lot of people look, back, look at it back after the fact and say, well, look who it was run by. And it was run by a bunch of poker players, old school poker players who are degenerates, et cetera, et cetera. We should have known, or you could have known. But listen, everyone knows the smart thing after the fact. And you have to realize that's the case. So you have to protect yourself. You have to protect yourself. And you do that by diversifying. And I mean, Dean Nelson said earlier, but what if you want to be able to have a chance to get rich? Don't you want to put a, a lot of your eggs in one basket? Well, a lot of people had their, their eggs in Enron stock, right? And that went to zero dollars. Plaza says, full tilt was a scam from start to finish. I generally disagree with this. I think it was a perfectly fine company, a fine idea. I don't think they were out to scam anyone. I think things happen though, inevitably, where they were just very bad at business. People don't people don't start businesses trying to scam people. When people actually end up scamming people, very often it was not their goal to scam you off the bat. They just ended up making poor decisions and they had to try to find some way to fix their problems. I mean, um, a good example is a random degenerate gambler, and come up with any of them, where they have a gambling problem, right? They have a gambling problem, and they know that if they borrow money from you, they have the potential to win the money back. Well, let's say they take, they borrow the money from you, they go gamble, they lose all that too. Well, now they're out your money, which they owe you, and they're out their money. So now they have to find someone else to give them money to try to win your money back, the other one's money back, and the other one's money back. If they win it, about, win it back on the third try, they pay back everyone, and then... They're clear. They did it. Success. But they may lose the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time and the eighth time and the hundredth time. And once you're at the hundredth time, well, now you're starting about playing re really, really big. And you have to keep moving up and up and up until inevitably you can't go up anymore and then you're busto. And everyone's trying to get all the money from you and you're screwed. Um, but initially, they don't really start off trying to scam someone. They have the idea that I'm going to play, I'm going to win it back, and... That's it. And they have something in their brain that makes them think that's what's going to happen. I mean, this happens in investing a lot, right? Like, say you invest in Enron stock and five other electrical companies. Enron goes broke. You just lost 18% of your money. Now you think, oh, my God, I have to get it back. So what do you do? You take more money. You buy more money in. Or you put more money in some other stocks. Maybe some of those go broke. Next thing you know, you're out all your money. Great thing about investing, though, it's hard to lose all your money. Also, don't put all your money in one sector. That should be very clear. If you invest into 100 electrical companies, yeah, electrical companies aren't going to go broke. But for all we know, maybe they all get consolidated into one big company. Then maybe that company screws up and then 20% of them go broke or half of them go broke. You have to be smart. You want to be in all the sectors because everything's not going to go broke. And if it does, well, we're all out of all our money anyway. So yeah, tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to be having a webinar for all of you. Make sure you sign up because space is limited. Um, it's going to be called, well, this is going to be discussing how to play from the small blind against a loose aggressive razor. So you can find information for that at twitter.com slash Jonathan Little or instagram.com slash jcardshark. Still waiting on your money from Absolute and UB. Yeah. What's the best way to count combinations? Well, for every unpaired hand, there are 16 combinations, right? If there's one of that card on the board, let's say the board is ace, seven, three, how many combinations of ace, king are there? There are four kings left, three aces left, right? Four times three is 12. There you go. Say there are two aces on the board, okay? Say it's ace, ace, three. How many combinations of ace, king are there? Two aces remain times the four kings, ace, king. Eight of those, two times four is eight. How many ace, queens? Two times four is eight. Eight, eight, eight. Eight, eight, eight combinations are available of all those. Say you know they're only gonna play ace, two suited, well, if there are two aces on the board, there's one, there's two aces left, right? Um, and the, the, like a, ace of hearts, ace of spades. A, I'm sorry, ace of hearts, two of hearts is available. Ace of clubs, two of clubs is available, but the spades and diamonds aren't because they're on the board. 
Um, let's say there's an ace and a king on the board. How many ace kings are available? There's three kings left and three aces left. Three times three is nine. Now for the pairs, if there's one, if there's no cards of the pair on the board, there's six combinations. If there's one on the board, there are three. If there's two on the board, there's one. If there's three on the board, obviously there's zero. Oh, there you go. That's how you count combinations. Then you do some math in your head and you add. Has there ever been a time when I reflected at the beginning of my career and realized how much I don't know? I mean, right now I realize I don't know everything. As I learn more and more from people who are better than me, you realize you just don't know a whole lot. And the cool thing is, back whenever I first started, no one knew anything. <laughs> and um, even today, no one knows anything. So we're all learning. We're all trying to get better. I mean, the whole reason I got involved with the Pokar Backing Company was to learn from them, right? I knew they had a lot of the best poker coaches in the world there, best players in the world, and I wanted to learn because I knew you can't keep up by yourself. You're, you, the odds that you are going to be the best person is very, very low. Like, imagine, right? If we all sat by ourselves in rooms and played poker by ourselves, what are the odds that Jonathan Little ends up being the best one out of the group? Almost none. And I don't have an ego problem, and I realize that, right? So what do I do? I go and I learn from a conglomerate of people who work together to become the best players in the world, and you learn from them, right? You learn from people who are better than you. It's vitally important that you learn from people who are better than you. And one of their best coaches, Michael Acevedo, is writing that book, Modern Poker Theory. I got him the book deal because I knew he's a genius. And uh, I wanted to see a book by him. How do you handle people who three bet like crazy? Play strong ranges and then don't fold. All right, well, I think that's all I have to say today. Hope you all have a great day. I have to get ready for this webinar tonight. I have to prepare the slides and all this. But yeah, tonight we're going to be discussing how to play from the small blind against the loose aggressive razor. But it's not as easy as it appears because, first off, how deep are we? Next, who is in the big blind? It's actually very important. If the big blind is a very good player, you need to be three betting almost everything. If the good blind is a very bad, a big blind is a very bad player, you need to be calling with a lot, right? So it's not just the, as easy as, oh, three bet a lot. They say when you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. That is right. I always enjoy being the dumbest person in the room because you can only go up from there. 9 p.m. is 3 a.m. for you. Well, watch out for the replay. Or wake up at 3 a.m. if you actually care that much. This goes back to, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about working hard on a day-to-day -day basis. People say, well, the webinar is at 3 a.m. for me, so I can't go. You can if you care enough right? Or if you're smart, you just watch the replay. But um, three, 9 p.m. Eastern time is when it is. We are always on Eastern time here because I'm on Eastern time, and that seems to be the time that most of the world uses as their quote-unquote normal time. At least most of the American world uses as their normal time. Um, yeah, if you can't be there live, that's fine. Watch out for the replay and then watch the replay. Live is great, though, because you can ask me questions in real time. At the end of this, uh, at the end of that webinar, there's going to be a question and answer segment so people can ask me their questions. And we're also giving away free books. So there's a bonus for showing up. If you show up, you get access to either strategies for beating small stakes poker tournaments or strategies for beating small stakes poker cash games. I'm giving away, I don't know how many books. There's going to be a thousand people in this webinar tonight. What's a thousand times, um, I don't know, what do they cost on Amazon? Five dollars? A thousand times five is five thousand. I'm giving away five thousand dollars tonight if people want to collect it. Um, doesn't seem wise, but uh, whatever. <laughs> Might as well. Why not, right? All right. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. I'll see you all tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time for the webinar. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Be nice to someone. Eat your vegetables.